First of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Łukasz Piątkowski and I work with Giant Swarm. I have nearly eight years of uh, working experience with Kubernetes, but most recently I'm working with a team that is responsible for developer experience. And part of this developer experience thing is our GitOps setup. And today I'm gonna show you something that comes from our experience from running that for a few years. So as you might get from my very long title of the presentation, um, I'm gonna touch mainly three areas or actually intersection of them. This is the platform, GitOps and fleet. So let me briefly introduce these three areas because in the intersection where we are, there is something and this can be pain and I hope that I can help with this pain at least a little bit. So our three areas, GitOps. I think that's the easiest one to understand and everyone knows what it's like. Uh, you put everything you have as a code, your configuration, your infrastructure, your applications, everything. You describe this as a code and then you keep this code in Git. Bam, you have GitOps. Platform is a little bit more vague. Uh, vague in this sense that it's not something you can point a finger to and say that's it. Um, but the general idea over here, oh, sorry. The general idea over here is that we build a set of tools that makes your developers and DevOps move faster and that makes deploying and configuring applications, especially at scale, easier. So the third hero is fleet management. And uh, let me briefly introduce the setup that we use at Giant Swarm for fleet management. Uh, over here you can see three main um, interested actors or parties, if you will. Um, this is, on the left side, this is our team. So basically a team on a provider side that is responsible for delivering um, everything that is needed for a customer to manage Kubernetes or actually a fleet, so a set of Kubernetes clusters and stuff that goes on those clusters. So deployments, applications and everything. Uh, the other party is the platform team already on a customer side. This is usually a group of people that really needs to be the glue between what is needed, what is internal, what is expected from a platform on the customer side because every customer is different and what developers from this specific customer need. And then we have dev teams. So the, the purpose of dev teams is basically to not be blocked to move smoothly, to move fast, and be able to deploy stuff quickly. And to make it work, we isolate our customers strictly into environments that we call installations. And every installation consists of a single management cluster, so basically a cluster that, that is responsible for doing stuff to all the other clusters. So creating, upgrading, managing, deploying applications, everything, your control point for what we call an installation. And then we want to drive all of that with a Git repository. And here you have it, a platform that is driven by Git and you have a fleet and everything is done. Um, thank you. Um, well, no, not really. The problem is that this is very oversimplified, especially on the left side. This Git repository component turns out to be pretty critical. I mean, there are problems. Obviously, Git is cool, right? Allows you to do all the stuff with code, text merging and everything. Uh, but well, Git has some drawbacks. And I don't even mean that. I mean, this can happen, right? And you have to keep it in mind because it will, most probably. But, okay, that's not what I meant. What I meant is that if you want to drive everything with a GitOps setup, the structure of your Git repository is really critical. So you have to really focus about how to lay out your repository, how to structure your repositories to make everything work. And then still, even if you do it really, really well, everything evolves. With time, you will have to do some migrations. That way or another, there will be migrations. And that's gonna be your second big pain point. And then there are some honorable mentions that maybe we will get to at the end, okay? Let me start with the most important thing, so repository layout. How do we deal with it? Like I said, I'm, I'm working with a team that is doing this for quite some time now, so 
how we approach it. Uh, well, uh, no, not really. I mean, that's the original approach we wanted to take, but then someone said that we are professionals and we shouldn't, and you know, stuff like that, and expectations, right? So, okay, we decided to do it another way and started to figure out what are the general ideas about layout of a GitOps repository. And it turns out that there are three main ones. Using uh, by directory, by branch, and by repository layouts. By directory, pretty simple. Single repository, single branch, you separate your environments, whatever environment means to you. This can be your dev, prod, and staging environment. Or this can be US, East, West, Europe, Asia, whatever. Environments, right? Stuff that you need to have a slightly different configuration for. You put them into different directories. This is pretty simple. It's easy to do a consistent change that affects all the environments at the same time. What is bad is that it's really hard to set permissions because there are no per directory permissions, at least on, at least by default in, in Git. And it's also bad for separating tenants because if you have multiple tenants and you need to strictly separate them, you can't really do that with this setup. By branch is quite similar. I mean, in here, we are creating a branch per environment. So for example, what you have in a dev branch goes to the dev environment. A very clean and easy way to see what is really deployed, for example, to a dev environment. Because it's good enough to check out the dev branch and you're done, you have full visibility. But it shares similarities with the by directory layout because still permissions are a problem. And here there is a new problem that is a, a doing a consistent change. If you need to apply the same change to all the environments, it suddenly turns out that you have to track the same patch across different branches, cherry pick it, and so on. It's easy to get lost. Totally doable on a technical level, but needs a lot of effort. So the final approach is by repository. It's good for permissions, because you can set different permissions for different repositories. It's good for isolation for the same reasons. It's bad for doing consistent changes, because if you need a change that goes to multiple environments, this means you have to go to every one of them, most probably. We will see a solution later. And, and do the change, right? So you basically repeat yourself over and over. So what's the choice that our team has taken and that we apply in, in production? The answer is everything. Why should we choose? We don't choose, we take it all. <laughs> right? Um, so here's our opinionated approach. We will use different ways of structuring a repository to achieve different features of our layout. So we will use multiple repositories to keep customers isolation because that's what we definitely need and want. We will also use a top level template repository to not repeat ourselves and we will reference this repository from different places. We will also keep multiple branches. By default, our normal deployment branch is still main. But for example, our customers, they sometimes go into what they call a feature freeze. And with the feature freeze, well, um, we are not allowed to change anything on their infrastructure, literally anything. So we can create a branch that is frozen for some time and reconfigure their infrastructure to be configured using that branch. And later, we will configure it back and merge it back. And finally, we will use multiple directories to manage different environments, different clusters, and so on. Here's that idea in a more graphical form. The top level, the pale yellow repository, is our templates repository. So in there, we provide different temp templates. Um, I guess the font is a bit small, sorry for that. Uh, but I hope it's still at least a bit readable. Over there, we keep templates. So for example, you can see there AWS template or Azure copy template. Uh, copy is cluster API, right? A native way, declarative way of creating clusters using another cluster. So you're basically just doing kubectl apply an object. And this object means create me a new cluster, for example, on Azure or on AWS. But it's not only clusters. This can be anything you want. For example, applications that are common and everyone uses like Grafana or maybe something else, Prometheus, whatever. We put those templates, the templates in there. This repository is not standalone. I mean, it can't be applied directly 
to a cluster, to an environment to, to configure it. This is only a base set. And then we have this yellow and orange giant swarm repository. That's the repository we use to configure our management clusters. So we use our own base repository, the templates repository, to get some templates from there. And using these templates, we instantiate and configure our management clusters. If a customer requests a freeze, we create a branch in this repository and reconfigure the selected management cluster of a tenant of a customer to point to this branch. And then we have actual tenants, like the blue and purple one. They also use the same base set of templates that we provide in the top uh, repository, but they are owning these repositories. So they can change whatever they like. They can include whatever they like. And then this is applied to their infrastructure. So what are the benefits? Well, git blame is one, right? Uh, no, not really. I mean, git blame can be useful. You can learn who made the change and you know who to contact, who to ask, with whom to explain. But the most important benefit for us is we have dry configuration. So we provide a template in a single place and it can be reused in all the other places. That's good. We have strict customer's isolation. We actually have a different configuration repository for each of the customers. So there's no crosstalk between the repositories. We can't hopefully get anything cross-polluted between different separated customers. And we expose our customers extension points so they can include what they want. We don't know everything. We need to allow our customers to customize what they get. For the platform teams on our customer's side, this is also really beneficial because when they start to build a platform, they need to use their internal knowledge. We as a service provider in this case, we don't know everything. We can't estimate, we can't create any possible template. We can't provide every possible configuration. What is needed is the knowledge, internal knowledge of specific customer about their processes, about their deployments, about how they do stuff in very general term. So instead of forcing them to use our ways, we provide our ways as an opt-in set of templates and they can choose from those templates, whatever they want, apply, enhance, extend. They don't have to start from scratch, but they can modify, they can include their knowledge and their skills and their procedures and then expose that to developers. So that developers in their company, they have a lot of options to choose from, but these options are already tailored to their needs. And hopefully this will make their lives easier and this will allow them to move faster. I won't be talking much about tools here because what I'm talking about is really pretty generic and doesn't really depend on the tool. But as you know, well, there are in the Kubernetes space, there are two most common um, projects, Argo and Flux. We chose Flux, we really like Flux solve some of our issues right away. Uh, I really recommend the project. It has a full native API for managing GitOps, but I'm mentioning this only because I wanted to show you quickly a simplified example. So this is how a cluster configuration can look like. The important part here is that we have these two code blocks. One is called resources and the other one is called patches. So resources tell us what this cluster is built from which objects need to be pulled in to create this cluster. This is a management cluster. And as you can see in the first resources line, we reference a remote repository. That's the template repository. And from there we pull a template for a cup A cluster. Cup A is copy for AWS. That is also configured to use Flux V2. That's our tool, that's why I also, also mentioned the tool. Additionally, in the second line, we include an extra feature of being able to manage EKS clusters. This needs some extra controllers to be deployed, and that's included in this cluster as well. And then we include a config map, we include some secrets, and so on. But these are only templates. Unfortunately, this is not a templating language. This is a full configuration that can only be patched. So basically, you're overwriting part of this configuration to get what you want. Hence, we need patches. And that's the more verbose part of the configuration. I shortened it here considerably. And I'm just showing you three examples of a patch being applied. 
This patch can come from an upstream repository as well. So if, for example, you have to or you want to disable a certain feature, you can use a patch that is being available in the template repository as well. This can be a shared, template, uh, sh sorry, shared patch template from your own repository as well, like the second example, or this can be something really simple and inline patch like in the third line. And here you have it, a configuration that is taken from a base repository with custom patches that make it work in this specific sense. So that's the brief description of how we deal with the problem of repository layout. Let me now move to the second problem of migrations because like I said at the beginning, well, at some point you will get to the step of migrations. You can start good, but it's really impossible that you won't have to make any changes. And actually migrations turned out to be pretty good for us. I mean, there's a general approach with, with a tool like Flux you can suspend the reconciliation. So you can tell the, your, your GitOps controller that, hey, for some time, starting now, don't apply the changes that go into the repository to my infrastructure, pause it, okay? And then you suspend all the objects or you just suspend all the controllers to be sure that nothing is really touched on your clusters. Then you do the changes in the repositories, you check them, um, because the setup is pretty complex, you double check them, and then you ask someone for a review, and then slowly starting with a test cluster, you start to resume everything in exact opposite order that you passed that, and if you did everything right, you can move stuff around. You can move stuff across repositories, you can move stuff across directories, you can change patches, you can do everything. And this is pretty good. And to help you with that, we have one extra feature that is called pruning. Pruning is pretty nice. What it means is that if you label an object with a flag that says prune true, it means that if a file that created this object is gone from a Git repository, it has to be deleted on the cluster as well. So you have something, you have a file, this file creates, let's say, a deployment, you delete this file, deployment is gone from the cluster. You don't have to clean up anything manually. Life is easier. Example, over here. Uh, commit number one, we have this third line. This includes a certain controller. Commit number two, there's no line at the end and it's gone from the cluster where you effectively uninstalled an operator or a controller, right? Uh, wait, um, oh yeah. Um, someone dropped an A in refactoring. Um, there's not much difference, right? Both extensions are valid, except that this file doesn't exist uh, in the remote, remote repository. And this means that all the objects that were described within this file, they don't exist now in the rendered template. This means that with prune set true, um, We've been there, <laughs> and it works exactly the way you expect. Uh, that's our test cluster named Grizzly. I asked Dali to picture the situation that we were in. I think the picture is really accurate. That's exactly how Grizzly looked like at that moment. So we actually recommend, by our experience, to not use prune true by default, because this is a double-edged sword, and you can cut yourself with it. So our recommendation, no, set prune to false everywhere for migrations and only deliberately turn it on when you're sure that you want pruning and you will be cleaning something up. Otherwise, it's easy to shoot yourself in your foot. Okay, um, so migrations, not that much of a pain, but a risky process. Pay attention to what you're doing. And now, like I said, some honorable mentions. I won't be going now into the details because, well, GitOps should simplify things and make everyone's life better and happier, and I'm talking about problems and more problems and dead grizzlies. Um, doesn't seem to match really, right? But yeah, well, by introducing a solution, you're also introducing some new problems to, to handle. So first problem, and we don't have a great solution for it yet, 
is about understanding the impact of your change. Like with this um, refactoring with prune turned on, no one was expecting this result, right? Um, but it's also entirely possible that with the setup where you have remote repositories, everything connected in different directories and so on, you do a change on the top level repository and you will be scratching your head wondering what will be the actual impact on end clusters, on the end rendered configuration. We have some in-house tools to do that, that pull resources from different sources, merge them together and render and so on. Unfortunately, that's very custom and not usable to the, to the wider um, uh, ecosystem. And that's where I think we, we still need to work on improving general stuff because I think this, this should be possible. This is very important that before you commit a change, you under really understand the impact of this change and you can preview this impact and not only think what you think that this impact does, uh, this change does. Complexity can also build up quickly. I recommend that a GitOps setup, a Git um, repository layout, but then you have patches. And on top of patches, you can have more patches. And on those patches, you can have more patches. And suddenly, after the third layer of patch, no one can understand what the final result is without really rendering everything out and checking the output. Be careful, don't overdo it. And also don't overdo it performance-wise because flags that we use in our production setup is really great in terms of performance. But we've seen some customers that were expecting this to be a rapid recovery tool. This means that if someone deletes anything on the cluster, it will be recreated within 10 seconds. So set reconcile to 10 seconds. No, you can't set reconcile to 10 seconds if you had hundreds of big objects that have to be reconciled. You will kill your system. Okay, so summary. We are building platforms. Our main objective is to make developers and DevOps lives easier, and that's the important part. And GitOps is great, and it indeed solves problems. It makes your life easier. You have a single source of truth. You have the ability to customize, and it can be made elastic. It's all good. Just remember that it's not perfect. You introduce some solutions. You also introduce some problems. Think about those problems in advance. The sooner you do that, the less problems you will have later on the way. And also, my recommendation is, whatever tool you choose, make sure that you really know this tool well. Because, in, for example, in, in our case, from Flux, we use almost everything Flux has. It's important to know what you can get from the tool before you start you know, building your own tools, your own shovel, right? And quick links if you're interested in more. The first one goes just straight to the Flux repository. The second one, we are actually created as a company, a public repository for our customers that want to opt in into GitOps management where they can go and learn and see and get a ready template structure that they can start with. It's a public repository, go there if you want to learn more and see some examples. Also, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if you noted that this top level repository on my graph had an arrow and it said this can be public. So we are actually at Giant Swarm, our top level templates repository is public. The repository that we use in production and apply everywhere. And that's the third link. You can go there and see how our config is structured and what we apply and how does it work. And finally, the last link is something that I'm preparing, um, well, still, and last, <laughs> last commits uh, this morning. But using the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure free tier, you can get a very reasonable, completely free, as in no money involved, Kubernetes cluster. And I have a setup that creates this cluster for you and also bootstraps full flux uh, management there and also deploys some extra tools. So if you want to practice, if you want to learn more, if you want to see how Flux works, you can go there, um, contribute, really contributions very, very welcome, but you will get a real cluster entirely for free and you can play with it and destroy it, well, better before you apply, you know, something really serious there. And with that, I wanted to say thank you. And if you want to download the slides, here's a URL for it in the QR code.
Thank you very much, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Questions? Um, thanks for the talks, and yes, Flux is a great tool, and Flux is scary, and um, there is um, Flux diff customization to give you really a server-side rendered output of what it wants to do. Just want to mention that. Yeah, yeah, we know we use it. It's part of the tool that I mentioned that aggregates all the repositories and, and renders the, the output for us. Uh, you mentioned that part of why you decided to go with Flux was that it solved a few of your problems immediately. Um, could you explain what, wh which problems it solved in comparison to, for example, Argo? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I won't directly compare with Argo because I haven't checked, at least for some time, Argo development. So my Argo knowledge is not up to date and it's entirely possible that Argo can do exactly the same. That's why also like in the, in the most part of this presentation, I'm not really referencing to Flux. It's just a tool that we use. Argo is in my opinion like probably 90% on par and you can achieve exactly the same thing with Argo. What we are happy especially with Flux about is full native API, which makes it possible to use Flux as a building block not end, your end product, end result. But by using this native API, you can immediately make it part of something bigger, like a platform. Uh, then we really like the composability, so the ability to merge with remote repositories that I showed as a key factor over here as well. And also pretty easy secrets management, um, secrets encryption uh, within the repository. Oh yeah, that's, that's what I mean also by, by native API, right? Everything you, you create with Flux is a native object and normal RBAC rules apply like to any other Kubernetes object. Anyone else? More questions? No? Thank you very much once again. Thank you once again.